Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? How about them cowboys? I really debated on doing that, but I thought, why not? You know, I didn't stay up and watch it because... Uh, you know, I have to work today. But anyway, um, for, for the rest of you guys, got to stay up and watch it. I'm glad you're here at nine. I guess everybody else will be here at 11. But hey, if you have your Bibles or your apps, we're going to be in Matthew chapter nine. Uh, do you remember the very first Christian that you ever met or the, or the Jesus follower that you encountered that made a positive impact on you? you remember that? For, was it a coach, maybe a teacher, maybe a camp counselor, youth pastor, maybe, maybe even your boss? I know for me, it was a guy named Coach John Black. Uh, John was uh, a coach when I was going to Spring Hill High School over in Longview, and I was in third grade, and I, I remember Coach Black so vividly talking about the Lord, and it just I, that made an impact on me. I'd never seen, and plus he was all muscled up, and he, he lifted weights, he's in great shape, and, and I always thought, man, that, this guy's cool. And then I, then I remember a guy named James Hester, who's gone on to be with the Lord, and uh, James was a leader of our RA group. Well, I grew up Southern Baptist, and uh, we had rural and Baptist. Ambassadors. And so James led that. Yeah, come on, uh, somebody. Uh, uh, we, I remember James just making an impact on me. And then this guy named Michael Gott, who's a, an evangelist and uh, traveled. And Michael came to our church about that time, a third grade, second grade, somewhere in there. And I remember him preaching and he had a, a daughter named Amy who I just... Maybe that's what got my attention. I don't know. I, at third grade, I thought she was so good looking and she was like 10 years older than me, but it didn't matter when you're in third grade, amen? And uh, I just, there's just certain people that's made impact. Now, here's, here's the thing. I know some of you were raised in Christian families. And you had great aunts, great uncles. You had great people around you all the time. And some of us, we've been swimming in Jesus water so long, it's hard to look back. It's hard to remember. Some of us have been saved so long, we have forgotten what it's like to be not saved. We, we've been swimming in the Jesus water so long, we don't even realize that there are people out there that may have an encounter with you. And some of you remember that encounter. Some of you remember that boss or that brother-in-law or that aunt or, or maybe it's that pastor's wife that just made an impact on you and it was the first person you ever met that, that claimed to love Jesus that you went, man, I could do that. They're, they're making an impact on me. So, so last week we started talking about Paul and what motivates Paul. If you were here last week, if you missed it, you can go back and you can grab that online and listen to it. But we started looking at a powerful motivation that Paul had. If you'll remember last week, we looked at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, where Paul said this, for Christ's love compels us. Everybody say compel. He compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And we, we talked about this last week that that word compel literally means we are con that, that, we are, that it hems in to hold on to both sides, to take away our options. That when we are compelled, our options are taken away to give no way out to back in a corner. In other words, Paul said this, we are hemmed in by the love of Christ. That is my motivation. That should be our motivation that... We are hemmed in, all of our options are out of the way, and this is the only way we go, and this is the only way we know. We're hemmed in by the love of Christ. Takes away our options. Backed into a corner. You ever been backed into a corner? That's what my daddy always told me. Don't you boys back, back me in a corner. You won't like me. That's what my daddy used to tell me. But see, when you're backed into a corner, you're not left with any options. And that's what the love of Christ does for us. It backs us into a corner where there are no options. And then when we become motivated, we become a great force for God's glory. Because we're not forgetting what God's done. 
But because God so loved us, it's now compelling us now to be an influence on others. You see, Jesus, when he walked the earth, he, he had an impact on people and, and, and he changed people. In Matthew chapter nine, he's just healed a paralyzed man and the Pharisees were watching him. And, and, and just like I would be in my day if I was there because I could be that Pharisee so easily that when Jesus walked by this uh, paralyzed man and he said, your sins are forgiven, they went, who does he think he is? Jesus read their mind and said, okay, you wanna know who I am? Just so you know who I am, get up your mat and walk. And the brother got up and walked and the crowds went crazy. And the Pharisees were like, what in the world? And then in Matthew chapter nine, verse nine, if that's not bad enough, let's read it. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. Now let's pause there for a minute because if you've been in church very long, you know what a tax booth is. If not, let me, let me kind of give you a crash course in political religious environment of Israel, actually Judea at this time because Rome had conquered almost everything up to this point. And they were in Judea, they owned everything, they were taking over everything and they set up a capital city there in Caesarea and they taxed the people like crazy. And Herod the Great built a city in honor of himself, Caesar Augusta in the Roman Empire. So if you were to dock your boat there in Caesarea and you pulled up to do trade and you were Jewish, the first thing you would see is this great big honking pagan temple to a, a Roman emperor. And you're sitting there looking at that the first thing, because he was considered a Roman God. And so when you docked your boat as a Jew and you walked up there and here's your home country, this is your promised land. And there's this Roman, there's this temple there. And, and you can just imagine what it felt like that it bothered them. That they're looking at this and they're going, man, there's no way. Roman soldiers walking the street, Roman soldiers everywhere. And then there's the tax booths. The Jewish people were so disturbed by this that they created a group called the separated ones. They created a group called the separated ones, the people who wanted to keep their hearts separate. And you can kind of see where this is coming from. They didn't want to be involved in all that. They weren't in favor of the Romans. They weren't in favor of the pagan gods. They weren't in favor of everything that's going on in the government. Doesn't sound familiar, does it? And so what they did is they separated themselves out because they wanted to honor God. And the Jews had certain practices that they followed and, and diet and laws and different things they did. So they, they created this group of separated ones and, and they believed that certain foods were clean and unclean. But here's what happened as they created this group. They also came to believe that there were clean and unclean people. The Romans were unclean. And the separated ones tried to make themselves clean. If you read through the ministry of Jesus, you've probably never heard that term or read that term in the Bible, separated ones. The word we have is Pharisee. The word Pharisee literally means separated ones. They wanted their hearts separated. They didn't want to be immersed in the culture. They didn't want to be affected by the culture. And so they wanted to be separated out. And, and they, the words Pharisees literally meant separated one. They wanted separated from the Roman and from, for God. So here you have Jesus walking down the road and he passes a tax collection booth and the Romans would hire Jews to collect Roman taxes in their villages. Now it's very interesting because if you want to collect the taxes then you need to hire somebody that knows everybody, right? You need to hire somebody that knows who owns everything. So the best the way they knew how to do that is they would hire Jews to come in and collect. And it was a bidding process. They, they would, the Romans would tell them, hey, this is how much we need. Anything you collect over that, it's yours. And so these guys would go out and they would collect taxes from their own brothers and sisters, their own Jews. And nobody liked tax collectors. That's true today too, isn't it? Yeah, April 15th's coming. Yeah. Let me tell you why you become a tax collector. The only reason I can think of for someone to come a, become a tax collector is they just simply didn't care. Because see, his reputation in the community is ruined. Because who wants to hang out with a thief? He just didn't care. Can you imagine his father's heart, a good Jewish man that his son goes into extortion? <laughs> he just didn't care. You see, tax collectors became part of the unclean and those who tried to be clean would never associate with him. Now look at verse nine. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, this is so incredible, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now Jesus picked a tax collector as one of his 12 disciples. Can you imagine that? 
One of the 12 that's actually gonna hang out with him, one of the 12 that's gonna follow him, one of the 12 that's gonna become his disciples. He picks a tax collector. I could think of a thousand people I would pick other than that guy, wouldn't you? I mean, think about that. Now, if you were a Pharisee, a separated one, one who's trying to keep his heart separated for God and separate from the Romans, and you saw Jesus do this, it'd really mess with you. It'd really mess with you. See, Jesus is making a statement here. And you would have some serious questions just like I would. You see, for some of you in this room, I need to tell you this is an important story for you. Because for some of you, if you wake up one day and discover that your decisions that you've made over the past few years have made and are leaving a wake of difficulty for other people, you need to hear this. And listen to me, some of you need to hear this because some of you have had some things uncovered. You ever had something uncovered? I have. And the shame and the guilt and the humiliation and the embarrassment. You see, this story's for you. And, and even if you're in this room and you would start thinking, man, I really like these separated ones. I really like these separated ones. And I, 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 this, this, this whole thing about us and them, whoever us and them are. Now listen to me, this story is for you. Now the story's beginning to heat up. Matthew decides to throw a party kind of a going away party, right? Hey, I'm going away to follow Jesus. So he invites all the tax collectors in town because who else is going to invite, right? He's not going to be inviting the Pharisees. He's not going to be inviting the separated ones. So he invites all of his cronies. There's probably Romans there. There's other tax collectors there. And Jesus shows up at the party and his disciples. And Jesus is hanging out with all these guys, those people. And look what happens in verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at the table in his house, behold, that's a huge word. It's a word we don't use very much in, anymore, is it? It's from the King James. Behold, that word literally means to stop still, to cease all else, to give our full attention and literally searching gaze to watch us before us. In other words, here's what Matthew is saying to us. Behold, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were, recli <laughs> were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. I think this, this word sinners there describes people who were on the outside, people who were not keeping the rules of separation that, that, that separated ones thought they should be keeping. And here they are, behold, Jesus has gone to a party. <laughs> so Matthew has dinner that's basically like a big tax collector's convention. And here's Jesus and his disciples and they're, they're hanging out. You ever been somewhere like that where you're so, I mean, what was the conversation? So how'd you get into tax collecting? So uh, take your kids to work often? I remember several years ago, I, I ran into an old buddy of mine that we graduated high school together. He was one year older than me. We worked together at Chick-fil-A when I was in high school and, and I was talking to my buddy and I said, so bro, what, what do you do now? He goes, I own a strip club. What do you say? <laughs> he knows I'm a preacher. Cool. <laughs> you can't say that. Can you imagine the conversation going on there? I mean, don't miss the gravity of behold. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I don't know what question's there, but everyone's talking, they're eating together, they're eating from the same dishes, and do you think this might have troubled some of the separated ones? I mean, someone's walking down the street and they looked in the open courtyard and they witnessed all oh, the others. Is that Jesus? What? I, I thought, what's he doing there? Look at verse 11. The Pharisees, the separated ones, asked Jesus' disciples, why? It's a great question, isn't it? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And listen, I, I would challenge you, don't judge the Pharisees here. I would challenge you here to read this as coming from a devoted and confused heart. You ever been there? You ever looked and seen someone hanging out with somebody else and it's us and them? Why are they hanging out with them? Why are they there? I mean, think about this. Don't see these men as pompous idiots. See these men as trying to figure it out. These are men that love God. These are men that really were trying to separate themselves and yet here's the one that they had been praying for for years and, and they're, they're still trying to figure out, is Jesus the real deal? And yet he's 
hanging out with them. He's hanging out with those kind. He's eating with people that are essentially robbing the Israelites blind. So the question is, what's Jesus doing? Is he condoning their behavior? Can he approve of what they're doing? And so the Pharisees asked Jesus' disciple a question that I think, I think is legitimate. I think it's a legitimate question that they, they needed answered. And Jesus gives them three responses. And the three responses have to do with health, mercy, and mission. Look at verse 12, and he responds to the Pharisees because well, the disciples were asked the question, Jesus responded to the question. Look what he says. But when he heard it, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. See, Jesus here is talking about health. You might have expected Jesus to kind of turn to the separated one and said, you judgmental people, well, how dare you? You see, that's sometimes my first response. How dare you judge me? How dare you judge me that I go to the parties on the weekends out at Lake Hawkins? Whoa, y'all got quiet. How dare you judge me that I go to Red Rooster and sing karaoke? I don't sing karaoke. But I go... You see, Jesus could have looked at them, how in the world can you judge these men? You, you should accept these men as they are. But no, Jesus says this. He's just so gentle. He just says, those who are well have no need of a physician. Those who are sick, that's why I'm here. You see, Jesus is calling the lifestyle, the tax collectors, unhealthy. He wasn't condoning it. He wasn't condoning what they were doing. He wasn't condoning what they were saying. He was just saying, look, I'm here because they're unhealthy. The reason why I'm in this place is because these men are extremely unhealthy. And he says it's precisely the sick people who need a doctor. The first part of Jesus' response is about health. In fact, if you jump over to Luke chapter 15, there's another group of Pharisees. Those Pharisees are questioning Jesus again, hanging out with sinners. And so Jesus tells three stories. You may remember this about that little lady, that lost lamb that the shepherd goes out to rescue. He leaves the 99 and goes for the one. And then he tells a second story about the woman who's got 10 coins who loses one and destroys the house and empties the house just to find that one coin. And then that great story of the prodigal son, that the prodigal son reaches his end and comes back home after he squanders all of his daddy's money. And Jesus doesn't condone what's going on here. He compares them to wandering sheep, lost coins, prodigal sons. He's looking at those people as a healthy matter that these people need health because he knows they're the ones in need of rescuing. They're the ones in need of a physician. The second part of Jesus' response in the beginning of verse 13 has to do with mercy. Look at it. Jesus says to them, go and learn what this means. He gives them a homework assignment. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus is actually quoting Hosea 6, 6. In the day of Hosea, 100 years before Jesus ever walked the earth, <laughs> in the time of Jesus, they were heavy on religious tradition and short on mercy. They went to the temple and they offered all kinds of sacrifices, but didn't show mercy to the people around them. And God says to them, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy. He'd rather them show kindness than, than to be ritualistic people. I'd rather you love each other. I'd rather you love those who need health. You see, when Jesus quoted that part of Hosea, those Pharisees were like, oh, I, I remember that. I remember that. And he refers back and says, Go, guys, don't forget. And look at the third part. Because the third part in verse 13 has to do with mission. Where Jesus says at the end of verse 13, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Listen, I'm not here in Matthew's house just, just because Matthew's somebody. Listen, no, 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 this is my mission. This is why I exist. This is why I came because there are people out here that are unhealthy, that need mercy, and this is my mission. And by the way, he was not only saying, this is my mission, he was inviting the Pharisees into his mission. Amen. And by the way, he's inviting us, all of us in this room. He came into the world for sinners. And listen, if you wanna be one of Jesus' followers, then there's one prerequisite. You ready for this? You gotta be radically flawed. Now, let me stop right there. 
You got to be radically flawed, man. Because that's how you come into a relationship with Jesus. It's to realize you're a sinner and your sin separates you from God. See, what Jesus is exposing here is that the Pharisees didn't see that everybody need rescuing. They, were, they had given up on the Romans. They had given up on those ones that weren't separated. They had given up and going, looking down their nose at them and judging those who went to them. My, how we have not changed. Yeah? Listen, don't judge these guys too hard because we're just as guilty. Let somebody walk into this church that's, doesn't have a beard, okay? Because most of you have one now. Come on, brother, let it grow. I know, you're like me, follically challenged. That's okay. Let somebody walk in here that doesn't look like us and see what we do. I, I, I know. You see, the Pharisees might have attention just to sake of looking at their self-righteousness and arrogance. The tax collectors had a propensity toward the sin of greed. You see, we all have our drug of choice. Some of us are greedy, and that's why you sin so much. Some of you haven't called that into obedience, and greed just doesn't mean money. That's why you're having an affair, because you're greedy. Some of us are indulging in pornography and indulging in things we shouldn't be. Mm, got quiet in here on that one. You see, Jesus doesn't approve of what the tax collectors do, but he spends time with them because he's there to love them and to rescue them. You see, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Hey, look at me right here. Look at me right here. We're the laborers. I'm not the laborer, okay? I know some of you grew up in a church. Well, that's pastor's job. Listen, welcome to Summit. You catch them, you clean them, okay? This church, the church of Jesus Christ, is full of the labor to have compassion, love, mercy on those who are without a relationship with Jesus. Listen, Summit Heights is full of laborers. Our mission is to win the lost, the severely flawed. Yes, amen. We're even to go to the religious who think they're saved. Come on. Nancy, would you come to the second service? <laughs> See, we introduced this whole concept two years ago, the hospital and spa. Because I, I really believe that the church is, should be the finest hospital and also the finest spa anywhere around. In fact, guys, put that first... Uh, um, slide up there because last year we, we, or two years ago, we introduced this whole deal that for all of us is that for us, when we go to church on any given Sunday, there should be four types of people in church. There should be four types of people in church. First of all, there should be those hellbound people. Yeah. And let me, let me tell you what I'm talking about here. And I don't want to miss one of them because I wrote down several of these. Okay. You ready for this? Here's what hellbounders are. Skirt chasing, cocaine snorting, pothead swingers, wheeling, dealing, lost sinners, and good people who live good lives but have no relationship with Jesus. Okay, stop, let me read it again. Here, here's what hellbound people look like. Skirt chasing, cocaine snorting, pothead swingers, wheeling, dealing, lost sinners, and good people who live good lives but have no relationship with Jesus. It's getting quieter. Let me read it one more time. Here's the second time. The second type we should have in here is baby believers, newborns. A healthy church should have people who are far, far from God, but we also are to have new, newborn converts, people who have just come into the kingdom, people who we are winning to Jesus, man. 
And then there should be those growing believers, those people who are growing in their walk with God, that they're, they're hanging out with God, they're believing the Bible, they're involved in church, they're tithing every month, they're, they're, they're studying the scripture, they're growing. And then there should be those followers, those self-feeders, those people that are spending time with God every day. They're hanging out with God. And you see, it's both a hospital and a spa. Because in, in, in these moments, we have these chaos moments, and these chaos moments are when you hit a wall, or maybe something your wake has caught up with you, and maybe you were exposed, and maybe there's some things happened in your journey where you realize that God's wanting to bring you to repentance and to believing who you are. Those are those chaos moments where sometimes we have to go back to the hospital. I'm not talking about you lose your salvation. Listen, you didn't do anything to earn your salvation. You're not gonna do anything to keep it, okay? It's all about Jesus. Jesus saved you. He sealed you. Therefore, you didn't do anything to get it, earn it, or, or do anything that caused him to do anything back then. It's all based on Jesus, man. So you're not gonna lose your salvation when you're sin. But what it does mean, you gotta go back and get some healing. And then you gotta start walking through this again. That's why we repent and believe. Repentance is no more than changing your mind to think like God. Confession is agreeing with God that what's in your life is sin. Yes. So when we repent, there's confession involved in that. And so we come back and we begin to grow again. But listen, there's also this healthy side of working out your muscles in Jesus. Amen? Yes, amen. That healthy side is that when we begin to send people, we want them to come back here and we want them to disciple. Who are you discipling? Who are you discipling? See, Paul had Timothy. Who are you hanging out with on a regular basis that they're imitating your life, that they're now walking with Jesus because they're imitating your life? Come on. But there's also this part of winning. There's this winning. That at some point, do you remember what it's like to be lost? Oh, man. <laughs> you see, the healthy church is to be a hospital and spine. Listen, We've had people come through our church and they've said this. Let me tell you something, preacher, preacher. The healthy church should be full of mature Christians. They don't have a clue about the Bible. Or how about this? Well, healthy churches should be just full of baby Christians. I, you know, I don't want to work in daycare, amen? I want them to grow up. I don't want my kids at home forever. Or how about this one? The church is not for the lost. It's only for the saved. They're clueless. They're clueless. Because let me tell you what happens. Guys, put that next one up. Because see, I want you to see this all the way across the stage. Because if you who claim to be followers of Jesus, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Those of you who claim to be growing in your faith, because you're reading the Bible on a regular basis, you're memorizing scripture, right? <laughs> Uh, you're meditating. Listen, I'm, I, I'm just being honest here, okay? Because some of us claim, and yet we're not. So if we are, then let me tell you what you'll be doing. You'll be winning. You'll be winning. And so what, what that looks like is you'll be sharing your testimony, man, during the week. There was a guy named Les Stagner who went home to be with the Lord several years ago. And I can remember a season when I was growing up at our church and we had those old school come to the front invitations singing 31 verses of Just As I Am. Y'all remember that? The buses will wait. You come now. Raise your hand. You remember that? And I loved them, man. Don't get me wrong, okay? But I remember one time Les Steigner went, I think it was 30-something weeks. He worked at Eastman Chemical Company in Longview, Texas. And it was almost for 30-something weeks when pastor would call us to stand, let's sing. And Nathan would come and, and he would sing to us just as I am. Old Les would grab the hand of a grown man and walk him down the aisle. They would meet with the pastor. We'd go through the invitation. They'd set him on the front row. And then they would get up and Brother Les would bring and introduce a man that he wanted to Jesus last week at Eastman Chemical Company. <laughs> Some of you go, well, I don't know how to win them to Jesus. Let me tell you what you can do. You can bring them here. Amen. Bring them to your small group. I, oh, that brings up another thing. You don't have a small group, then start one. Amen. You see, the church, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, I, I, <laughs> I was sitting at the convenience store the other day and a guy was asking me, how long you lived in Hawkins? And I was like, ah, 13, 14 years. He's like, really, I've never seen you. 
I'm like, dude, I was in here like three days ago. <laughs> so I kind of explained to him, we lived at Holly Lake, then we moved into town. And I said, and I'm the pastor at Summit Heights. He goes, really? I said, yeah. I said, you ought to come join us. He goes, you'd let me come? I said, man, I'd love to have you. I'd love to have you. I was making sure. <laughs> he may be here at 11. And again, he may be working. You see, if, if we're really called and we're really following, then we're going to be winning. We're going to be training. Yeah. We're going to be sending. That's why we exist. Do you remember what it's like to be lost? Yes. I mean, come on, I know some of us have been swimming in Jesus a long time, man. Some of you are sitting here this morning, you know exactly what it feels like because you're there. You've never had peace and you've been going to church on and off for years. And yet there's something in you that says, I, I want that. I want that. And you've gotten close to the door so many times and the enemies yelled at you and screamed at you and whispered at you, you're too bad. God will never forgive you. Listen, that's why the cross is here. And, and by the way, behold, stop and look. Look who Jesus hung out with. Drunks, sinners, adulterers. <laughs> behold, woman, I am he. Remember that woman at the well? Go get your husband. I don't have one. Joe, you're right about that. <laughs> In fact, the man you live with is not your husband, and, and you got five of them. Behold, Jesus just said, look, stop what you're doing and look. Can I just say to you, is there somebody in here this morning? Behold, yes. his name is Jesus and he loves you and he already knows about all your stuff. Yes, he, he already knows about everything yes. and he is calling you into a relationship to convert, to be transformed yes. and be made new. I just wonder if there's somebody here this morning, that's you, that that's you, that you would just be willing to say this morning, you know what, I know I'm a sinner. And I know we grew up in East Texas and we're, we're swimming in the waters of Jesus like crazy. I mean, drive down the road, there's like 94 churches. Amen? Amen. And if you're new in church and this is the first time you've been here in a long time, then... But what if this morning it became real? Behold. Behold. See, that's why we exist. If you're visiting this morning, you couldn't have come on a better Sunday because this is why we do what we do. This is why we ask you to give money. This is why we ask you to attend. This is why we ask you to play in a band. This is why we ask you to go change diapers. This is why we ask you to, to hang out at doors and wave at people and smile. Yeah. This is why we exist, because we want people who are lost to be converted, because we want to win people, train people, and send people out, because there is a world out there. The harvest is plentiful. It's just the laborers are few. It's just the laborers are few. Danielle and I talk about having a garden all the time. <laughs> Wouldn't that be so cool to have a garden, we'll say? Man, that'd be awesome, man. We could just grow our own vegetables and eat out in the backyard, all that. Come to my backyard. I hadn't raked in like two months. I got one of my neighbors over here. She'll, she'll vouch for me right now. Because at some point, you got to do more than just talk about it. <laughs> at some point, somebody got to go out there and start digging. My fingernails are clean. Listen, at some point, the harvest... It's plentiful. It's just, are we going to be a church that's comfortable as the Pharisees, as the separated ones, and never go get our hands dirty? Or are we going to be a group of people that we're going to win, train, and send? You're going to hear that so much. You're going to see that so much this year because that's why we're here. And I think we've forgotten what it means to be lost, to invite people to Jesus, yes. to invite them to a place that's safe, to invite them to a place that they're welcome. You see, nothing would please me more 
than for people to walk past us and go, oh, why is he hanging out with them? Mm-hmm. You probably never heard a preacher say that, have you? See, I grew up here and stay away from them. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't listen. I'm not condoning what they're doing. I'm just saying what they're doing is unhealthy. And so let's go and let's have mercy on them and love them. Amen. I I, I see these things all the time where people are so mean, man, we need to hammer on people and, 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 and just, I don't know. That wouldn't have worked for me. Here's what I know is my sin separated me from God. And I didn't want to spend eternity in hell. And so I confessed my sins and repented. And I gave my life to Christ and he saved me. And that was 35 years ago. I've not been the same. Oh, I've not been sin free. Don't look at me that way. Okay, because I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. Amen. I've never been the same. And I want that for Hawkins, for Mineola, for Harmony, for Big Sandy. For our schools, it's not a week goes by we don't hear stories of students who are struggling with stuff I've never even heard of. Harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. You see, Jesus said this in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. When Jesus came to them and said, all authority. Everybody say all authority. authority. Come on, say it again. Say it with me. In heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always. So now catch, catch what Jesus just tied together. All authority has been given to me, and I'll never leave you. So if he has all authority over demons, over everything and this earth, and he says, I'll never leave you, then understand what he's saying. If all authority has been given to him, and he says, I will never leave you, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age, that means this, you have all the authority to go forward without fear, without any intrepidation, that you and I now have the same authority as Jesus Christ, because Jesus now lives in us who are believers, and now we can go in authority and begin to love and show mercy to other people. Amen? So here's the deal. Three of us. Um, We exist to win, to train, and to send. Connecting people to God and others. Bottom line, relationship. Let me say that again. We exist to win, to train, to send. Connecting people to God and others. And the bottom line's what? Okay. We exist to win, to train, to send. To connect people to God and others. What's the bottom line, Summit? What is it? Say it again. It's hard doing that, isn't it? See, some of you are like me. You're like, I ain't saying it. <laughs> That's why we exist. That's why we're here. So here's my challenge to you. I asked you last week, what motivates you? What motivates you? It's the love of Christ. Do you remember what it was like to be lost without a relationship with Jesus? And do you remember that day? I do. I'll never forget it. I remember that day that I surrendered my life to Christ at 15 years old. I can remember it like it was yesterday because it was right down the road at Brookhaven Retreat, Damascus Storm. I talk about it all the time. Green carpet and all, still there. (laughs) 35 years later. Changed me. Don't ever forget that. And listen, if you're here this morning, I don't care how long you've been in church, you may be a Pharisee. You may be someone that has gone to church all your life, but you've never surrendered your life to Christ. I invite you right now to admit you're a sinner, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and confess him as Lord. That's how you're saved, and it's that simple. Would you do that? Anybody willing to do that this morning? Let's pray together. Father, I love you, and I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that Jesus didn't come to um, condemn us. He came to save us because we were condemned already. Most of us in this room that don't know you already know how far from you we are. And so God, I pray this morning you'd give them courage right now where they had set just to admit they're a sinner in their own words, that they would believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, confess you 
as Lord. And God, you'd save them. So radically, fully forgiven, fully loved because of the cross. God, would you do that now? Father, for those of us in this room that we do have a relationship with you, but God, we're comfortable. We, we like coming and sitting, and listening and being taught. We like singing. But God, we've forgotten that the harvest is plentiful. As Jesus reminded his disciples, harvest is plenty. They're, they're, it, it's, it's easy pickings. It's just the laborers are few. So God, I pray today that you would ignite, you would compel us, you would hem us in, you would back us into a corner where all of our options are gone. I pray for more Les Stagners and John Blacks. I pray for more of Michael Gotts, more of James Hester's Lord, people that loved you, people that walk with you, and people who influence lost people to give their lives to you. God, give us courage as we win, we train, and we send, and we reach our community for Christ. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his beautiful and most precious name. And everybody said. Now, before you go, before you go, hang on. Anybody pray that prayer this morning? You'd just be willing to raise your hand? Come on. Be bold. Anybody? Give you this going once. Going twice. We're not going to have you stand and do cartwheels, okay? Anybody? All right, so here's the deal. That means every one of us in this room are saved. Pretty bold assumption, isn't it? What are you going to do? Go win, go train, get after it. Amen? Amen. You're good, dismissed. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.